All right, everyone, thanks. Welcome to the second grade meeting. So we've got a few demos today and looks like we've got three different demos, different layers in the stack. We've got um, a couple user interfaces and uh, for different types of users. And then we've got a technical uh, discussion. And then at the end, I'm gonna give a survey of all of the work necessary to turn HTTP into a decentralized, fully decentralized protocol. And that's especially at the behest of Ben. Um, so we can get started. Um, Dwayne, do you wanna give us a little demo? Yeah, sure, let's do. So um, uh, just as, as introduction, I, as some of you have seen it, it was in the uh, Braid Dis Discord channel. Um, this is called Ribbon and it's, um, sort of the beginning of a microblog that could be um, hosted uh, by anyone, but still accept subscriptions and patches and um, in the future, uh, create a um, create an attention economy um, or even without the economy, I'm not sure. An attention function that's shareable is kind of, I think Mike's vision for this. So um, what that means is rather than you relying on a uh, on a platform like Twitter or Facebook to create a function that tells you what you should be paying attention to. The idea here is, can we create a, a shareable function? Like I care about certain resources. I care about certain topics. I care about certain people. And then I can reshare that caring uh, to somebody else who's like me or who, who is interested in what I'm interested in. So um, that's the, uh, that's the ultimate goal. But today what we have is uh, a fairly, um, simple start, which I will share screen and show. Uh, let's see here, desktop share. Um, hopefully that's working. So um, we have, <clears throat> actually this is on the uh, braid.news slash ribbon site, which you can all go to if you like. I, um, I messed it up, Dwayne. I, I oh, put okay. that post there. That's oh, that's okay. Yeah, no, this is, this is uh, all open right now. There's no logins, we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can post, uh, you know, something new. Um, and just post, uh, post something like a little microblog, as you would expect. Now, under the hood, um, this is uh, going to um, actually this is going to my site right now. So I'm configured. I'm using the front end, but it's configured to um, my back end. So we could change this and uh, is it uh, invisible.college4545, Mike? Is that the default? Yeah, that's the one I made. So if I go to this um, backend, this is now just a different HTTP get request, but to a, a different server. And so um, now uh, my posts and my gets are happening to that server. So um, post. Invisible college should join. So there's uh, there's that one. So um, actually, I wanted to show something uh, uh, that hasn't been seen before. I don't even think Mike's seen this yet. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's do a. Uh, Interesting post with a link to, actually, let's just do Twitter again. So as you can see, um, this Twitter link is not clickable, but if I go to my local server, um, I've added clickable links because my view of things, I wanna be able to see clickable links. So um, if I change this to, uh, Invisible college, what we were just looking at the back end. Oh, I forgot the S. Now, my view of things has clickable links. So, if I click on this, I'll go to Twitter. Ooh. So you can see with, with further development, like anybody could create a front end to the data that's underlying uh, this decentralized, uh, aggregatable attention economy. So any questions? Um, One thing that really stood out to me here 
is that you've got like three different views of these posts, depending on if they have a title and have a body. And, yeah. and that feels like, like what, we're, what we're able to do here is make these apps that are gonna be connecting to state from all over the web, which might be represented in different ways and pull it all together. And so we might start seeing apps that are more flexible and heterogeneous in how they present data as well. I look forward to that. We're too, we're, we're so tied to a, a complete vertical stack, right? Of like all of the things. It's like my friends, my, the, way I vis, the way I view it and the data itself is all inside a silo. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks for watching. I think Angelo might have a. Did you? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm grappling with uh, the way the IndieWeb handles the concept of schema right now. I don't know. Who, raise your hand if you're familiar with microformats. Mm. You've all heard of them, right? It's putting classes in HTML, and boom, you've got uh, a little mini schema, if you will, or a semantic object. Um, so back in the beginning, I was like, okay, hard coding my client interface to have like, okay, notes. This is a note designer note editor and then here's slash notes is all of my notes and over here i've got photos and photo posts but uh it turns out that the sort of elegant way of handling it is to not concern yourself so much with uh, what the overall object is and just sort of like give it the necessary mark up the semantics that are already on the page so you wind up with these like quasi, maybe it's a note post, maybe it's a photo post, maybe I shouldn't worry too much about it and just try to render it as good as I, as you know, best as I can. Because mind you, in the indie web, you're consuming uh, microformats and HTML from other people's servers. So they're producing, and it could be garbage, you'd have to be flexible. And yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with the problem you're <laughs> describing. And I, I don't know, I just kind of want to throw out that secondary level of like dy dynamism that's that's a bad word but i think I, I think you guys know what i'm talking about absolutely yeah a good word um i i had a i had a comment slash question that's less uh less insightful i'm just i'm i i like it's, it's a nice design i'm just curious whether you made this design yourself um, I'm, I'm, I was inspired by a, uh, a designer, so um, somebody else <coughs> created that look, um, and so I, I copied the look. That's great. I, um, <coughs> I think it's beautiful. Thank you. And thank them. Thank, thank them if you see them. <laughs> That's about, at least one other person thinks their design is fantastic. <laughs> Angela, I'm, I'm curious about your experience with the microformats. And you're talking about this second level, second layer of dynamism. I think what you're saying is like, okay, so the site's gonna have their own data model for stuff inside of it. But then whatever it is, it's gonna like kind of add a, a markup on it that's in one standard format. Is that that second level of dynamism you're talking about? And have you had like good or bad experiences there? I guess you're saying that even if they do mark it up, sometimes you have to do some stuff because it's not perfect. Is that the kind of the case you're running into? Yeah, so uh, I like tried to write a crawler a couple of years ago to crawl the indie web, hopping from one site to the next, um, trying to stay on indie websites. So if there weren't microformats, I wouldn't keep going. Um, at, so I got a whole bunch of indie uh, microformat content. Um, there's microformats version 1.0 and 2.0, and they're kind of different. And 2.0's got a lot of the edge cases handled better. Uh, the parser coverage is what it is. There's their whole thing is uh, lots of different implementations. So there's no one good, true, solid implementation. That said, now if I were to do the same thing, and I kind of am, but in a different context, the microformat support has gotten much, much better. Breadth and depth and uh, uh, correctness. Um, and there's a specification that one of the co-founders, Tontek, wrote called uh, Post Type Discovery, PTD. And it's like just a little tiny spec that kind of walks you through sort of reverse engineering a 
content type from the semantics found on the page. So you can kind of do it in a sort of loose manner. And as new content types emerge in the wild, uh, they can sort of be distilled down into this list. So there is sort of like a way to make sense of the madness in a spec form, but it's its own little tiny spec. So this is a spec that says if you have some types of microformats on a page that you can infer that this whole object is this other thing? So on this ribbon demo, and I was playing around with it yesterday, I don't know if you had to go clean it up. Um, if you only give it a title, it renders one way. If you only give it a note, a content, it renders another way. And if you give it a title and content, it renders another way. So in like, I'm immediately invoking indie web world stuff and there's an article and a note. What is the difference between an article and a note? A title. So, it, you know, if there is a title, if there's just content, then it's a note. If there's a title, then it's an article. If there's a photo, then it's a photo post. If there's a photo and a video, then the video takes priority. It's a video post with like a sub photo. You know, that's, I, I might've gone a little too far there, but that's kind of the gist of what they're trying to do with making sense of various post types. Hmm. So one thing that seems I guess it looks like the way that we're going here is, I guess, maybe just comparing these two approaches. And I'm trying to maybe learn from the experience, the AnyWeb experiences. And so I think the approach that we're going here seems to be we've, we're exposing JSON, first of all, instead of having like um, tags, you know, markup on and stuff. Um, and then with that JSON, we're starting off with just putting data in a certain format without trying to define this is like a post or this is an article or this is a note. Um, from your experience, like where would you see these the trade-offs in these different approaches that like any web's taking or braid's taking so far? So uh, it might still be there, braid.news slash indie web. I kind of mentioned this idea that you can take any HTML page and turn it into uh, JSON. Right. So there, or like a series of JSON objects. Um, maybe it's best to just look at it um, I think I know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of parsers out there. Some of them do a better job than the others, but yeah, basically, let me just show you. And then you can tell me, if, yeah, cool. uh, can you see my browser? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, X-ray. That's, this is a, one of the co-founders, Aaron. Sorry. I don't want to draw it's too much time. I think this is it. Okay. So we'll use his own exam, his own website as an example. So this is an HTML page. I don't have JavaScript here. What the heck? Um, come on. <laughs> Let's see, let's get a little something more interesting, like a post. Every, and here's, here's something, like his homepage is only showing an H card on it. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Other people have like all of their homepage marked up. Um, the entry, okay, there's the JSON. Yeah. Um, so ignore this stuff right here, uh, the data, is all one big JSON that describes the author is an H card and that's de denoting himself. Content is the content of the post, which you can see it was a, it was a note. There's no title. It's just like a tweet, if you will, a note. So it just has content. Ignore the two variations of the content. Mm -hmm. Syndication denotes that it was posted elsewhere. You can see that those are two offsite categories of tag. URL is like a permanent identifier. It's a UID. Published is published, and the type is an entry. So this is all codified in uh, the HTML here with a uh, simple, you know, uh, there's e-content, uauthor. Those are microformats. And then they can always be distilled down into a JSON object as such. So if you wanted to steal that vocabulary work, I'd say that might be worthwhile or at least looking worth looking into. 
have you found advantages in your experience to having that vocabulary versus say it again um, have you found advantages to having that vocabulary in your experience, like um, using this stuff? Yeah, so they have a whole process of how they find the vocabulary. And it just seems like it's 10 steps ahead of every other schema in existence. It's just sort of like a, you know, academic cabal saying, hmm, well, maybe we should do likes like this. Well, the indie web are like, gosh, maybe likes are harming society. Like maybe we should not do likes or do them in this way because it's just better for humanity. So there's a lot of discussion about each and every property, not just its name, but it's like its semantic value and whether or not it belongs in the H recipe or the H instruction manual or something, you know? Um, and they're starting with the most existing semantic objects out there in the wild. That's why they came up with essentially H cards for people and H entries for blog posts. And then there's others as well. Um, and I think it's I think it's really valuable, actually. If nothing else, just sort of reuse the property names. Um, let's see, for example, uh, microformat, my microformats.org slash wiki slash h entry. So you've got properties, core and draft and proposed. So there's like various levels, like this is the stuff that's out there being used. And then here's some stuff that isn't quite being used very much. Maybe one or two or three people are kind of giving it a try. And once it's sort of like they've been publishing over a period of time, it can be upgraded to a core property. So these guys have sort of met, uh, passed the test so far, the smell test of like longevity, which is kind of what you're dealing with when you're dealing with language and semantics. It can evolve over time, but it like, it should mean something to more than just yourself. And I think that's the consensus issue that we're trying to solve. And I think you, Ribbon already is touching on it. And I think just previous conversations of Braid sort of mentioned, and the D-Web in general, I was watching P. Frazee's live stream earlier today where he's implementing comments and replies of replies. So uh, everyone's trying to solve the same problems here. Let's just, you know, reuse where we can. All right, end of spiel. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thanks, that was really helpful. I really like that little tool to see. I, I tried adding um, a bunch of this, uh, you know, um, extra tags to my blog and I had no idea whether or not I did it right. Like, <laughs> I just, I was like, okay, I, I, do I support, do I do it? Like, um, yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm totally in support as well of having like standard vocabulary for this stuff. I was at, um, sitting in the, the JMAP um, IETF room, uh, what, a year or two ago and you know, a lot of the very boring conversation was around like, you know, what does, what, what name field should be having contact cards in a, you know, in a calendar event and this sort of stuff that's like, I really want, I really want like an answer and for people to have a good hard think about it. And then after that, I can just copy them and it seems like a good approach. Cool. Any more questions or thoughts on ribbon? Um, so, uh, just real quick, is this kind of long polling, but like a standardized way of long polling? It's, yeah. it's doing, it's got push, push notifications. Yeah, go ahead, Dwayne. Yeah, so um, Braid ha uh, has several levels of capability that, um, that we're trying to demonstrate, and we're only at like level two right now. Um, so what that uh, the, the basic capability level one that adds above HTTP is the subscribe capability. So um, it's like long polling, but it's, it's HTTP with a specific header that tells the client um, and the server is aware of what, what it should do with the subscribe uh, when it's requested. It should basically not close the connection. So any new information that's coming is just, it just keeps going down the same, uh, the same stream. Um, it, it, isn't that, ha, I guess, maybe I don't know what long polling is, but I 
thought that was long pulling. You send like a keep alive header and then it just doesn't close the connection. You can continue to like. It, it is, it is long yeah. pulling. Yeah. Um, uh, cool. Yeah, the difference is that we're adding a bunch of formalized semantics on top of long pulling um, and then some other stuff too. We want so to scale up. Yeah. Long, right. long pulling yeah. also closes the connection after it sends the first body. And then the client Sometimes. has to initiate another connection to the server. And so the long pulling is that it's referring to being pulling that the client keeps making requests. And the long pulling is that when it makes a request, it'll do it before it even knows that there's going to be a response. And then just holds that open until there's a response and then it gives it back. Oh, and it closes and then it restarts. And it closes a new it one. and restarts a new one. Yeah. And so it means there's some latency in between the, because um, that's a reset of a new connection. Okay. Because I was looking at servers and I think Dwayne met some problems here. Maybe we can talk for a second. Um, I'm in Python world and I couldn't use my standard. Uh, I would have to go for like a tornado or a twisted. Right. Um, which I'd be willing to do. Uh, I could learn it um, for at least a simple case. Uh, but can you put it behind Nginx or do you lose some of this sort of long, long connection? Yeah, long so enough. far I haven't been able to succeed at it. Um, I, I have like partially working things, which is basically not work working. <laughs> so I've uh, had some success where it like it accepts the connection, it pulls, and then um, Nginx is doing something where it's like uh, uh, not sharing or not like switching different clients. So somebody else will come on and then it'll like, it'll stop uh, for, for the first user. Um, so there's something something else that I need to fix there. But I, I, I'm also not confident yet that HTTP 1.1 is really what we want. So the way I'm used to doing web apps is I have like a standard HTTP um, server running, right? Like 1.0 or 1.1. And then I put it behind an Nginx proxy that takes care of SSL and like it can upgrade to HTTP 2 and WebSockets and all sorts of great stuff there. Um, but it looks like um, the way that we're developing Braid, we really need HTTP2 to make it um, a good experience. And, and HTTP, HTTP2 requires SSL. So um, the reason we need HTTP2 is that you can basically multiplex the streams. You can have as many open long polling or whatever we're calling this subscriptions as we want, um, which makes a lot of sense. It's, it's efficient. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's careful with bandwidth you can have as many as you want so um that's kind of i think what the what the standard braid server will look like is it's an http server of uh, http2 server of some kind with ssl and uh and a um uh a certificate installed cool cool i haven't played um, around with uh all of this long or this long connection stuff since uh http2 so i'll take that into yeah and, and I just want to like name a few things in here. I, I implemented Node Browser Channel, which is an implementation of Google's browser channel long polling um, method from Gmail um, a bunch of years ago before WebSockets was a standard. Um, but um, we can make it work through Nginx. I've gotten some things working through Nginx. Um, if you Google how to do it with service end events, basically you end up with the same, you know, a few lines in your Nginx configuration saying like, hey, for any of these URL paths, just ignore any of the caching stuff and pass the packet straight on and it works fine. Um, the, I do at some point, I would love to have integration in it, Nginx and things like that because we've got formalized semantics. I think it would, it should be pretty easy for something like Nginx to do fan out. So like, you know, if Nginx made one connection to, to braid on the back end, and then Nginx could be able to handle, you know, 10,000 people subscribing to the same document. I think that should work really well. Um, I think it'd be a really great addition to Nginx and different tools like Nginx, but, um, you know, once we've got support and once we've got it as a standard. Um, so yeah, um, but I, like I hear about the HTTP2 stuff, like that's something we need to figure out how we want to address, but um, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, anything else on Ribbon or should we move on to Greg? Do you want to show us your status of getting Auto merge integration. So um, auto merge is a CRDT, and we're adding support for auto merge to Braid, and also YJS, which is another CRDT, so that they can both speak the Braid protocol. And eventually, if we can get them to merge in the same way, they should theoretically be able to interoperate between YJS and auto merge. But at least in the interim, we should be able to have auto merge 
interoperating with itself and also with for very simple edits like handwritten patches and things like that. Yeah. Um, I just shared a thing. Can you guys see this thing? I've never tried sharing just a yes. single window. Yeah, I can see that. OK, great. Um, I'm going to click on, can you guys see my cursor in here? Yeah. OK, great. Yeah. Um, so auto merge is, um, how many people here have heard of auto merge? <laughs> I feel like everyone has heard of it. How, are, are people familiar with how auto merge? Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about how auto merge works. Hopefully I don't bore anybody with, with this. This is, I mean, it's in the demo section, but demo is maybe a strong word for, for what this is. Um, I'm going to, in the end, as, as Mike was saying, the idea is to have these um, different synchronizers talk to each other. Um, having a like having auto merge talk to YJS directly does have a kind of a core issue. Like at some point, there's there's a merging issue. Like things will be inserted into the same place, and um, there's a big question about whether auto merge and YJS are going to sort them the same way. This does not deal with that. This is making the assumption <clears throat> that um, we're just gonna, we're gonna take auto merge and we're gonna have it talk to other auto merge clients using the braid protocol. Um, and if it's talking to other clients that are auto merge clients, then it should work perfectly. But if it's talking to clients that are not auto merge clients, then it will not merge correctly, but, um, but it'll do something. It'll be like, it'll merge a lot of things correctly, um, but some things not. Anyway, here is an auto merge message. This is a, an actual auto merge method message that I copied out of auto merge. This is the, the performance branch of auto merge. They have the auto merge that you would get right now if you went to auto merge and got it, but they also have this new version that they're going to come out with. And this is the new version. Um, it is structured uh, kind of, so braid is structured um, every, uh, everything that, every change, which we call a version, has a version ID, um, similar to this thing's hash. It has parents, similar to this thing's dependencies, and it has patches similar to this thing's operations. Um, anyway, so uh, auto merge also has some other things. It has this uh, actor, the sequence start up time message. Um, so I'm going to say what each of these are precisely, and then we're going to show how to convert them all into a braid message. Uh, so the actor ID is uh, a unique number that's meant for that peer. It turns out uh, in the new version, the actor IDs have to be hexadecimal numbers, and they also have to be even in length. Um, I don't know why, but anyway, the sequence number, these are monotonically increasing. They're not just monotonically increasing. These are, they increase one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and that might, uh, there's a, these actor sequence numbers are similar to, but not the same as these things, which are also uh, a, a number and an actor ID. Um, but we'll get to those in a moment. But these are um, these are different. Uh, this start op this says what the first operation here, what its ID is, what what its ID that would be here. So this is start up 13. So this operation here, if someone else were to refer to it, it would have the ID of 13 and then the at symbol and then uh, this actor ID. Um, so that's what start op is. Uh, time, this is the number of seconds, un uh, Unix time of when the thing happened. Message is just an auxiliary, it's kind of like a commit message. It doesn't have anything to do with the the rest of this. Now, hash is a 
SHA-256 hash of some incarnation of, of this object. I don't know the exact, probably you sort it alphabetically. I, I don't actually know the formalism that it uses before it creates the hash, but it's a hash of, of this data. And dependencies are hashes of previous changes, namely the changes that this change depends on. I assume that um, they take the hash out before they hash the document and then insert yeah. the hash in. Okay. Yeah, they, they must. <laughs> yeah. um, but I believe these are in it. And so in that sense, it's like a blockchain. The hashes are cumulative and, you know, in some sense, uh, refer to the, I mean, you know, these bits are in the hash, but as you point out, these bits can't possibly be in the hash. Um, so for ops, I say can't possibly, that's not true, <laughs> but not, not in our lifetimes. Superior alien intelligence could include the hash. Yeah. Okay. yeah, if you saw it happen, show me. I, I, <laughs> I just, I want to see it in my, in my lifetime, a hash within a hash that knows about itself. For the ops, uh, each of these objects um, is, it's going to be an edit of some kind. Uh, it has a, an action. The action can be set. Um, I'm trying to think if there are, that, I'm not even sure there are other actions right now than set because they have this other thing that is uh, a Boolean that says whether it's an insertion. And so an insertion is a set, but also a set is a set. So at the moment, I think everything is a set. In any case, so that's what these two guys are doing. They're saying what we're doing, which is we're gonna insert something. Um, these guys say where to do it. Object is like if we're inserting into an array, obj is gonna be the array that we're inserting into. An element ID is gonna be the the element within that array that we're gonna insert directly after. If we weren't doing insert, if we were doing set, then element ID would be the element that we're setting. Um, and why it, is element ID's value, um, and it looks like an actor and a sequence ID? Yeah. Why so is, is that, it that? Is that like a parent then? Sort of like saying that I want to insert after this thing yeah that's exactly yeah. that's exactly what it is this okay. is the this is the the item in the data structure that it's going to insert directly after so this item must be some item in an array um or a text thing which is an array of characters in auto merge world um yeah, but the, just to sorry but i guess my my point of confusion is around like the array um I'm guessing the array has both like the actual values and then like uh, like another array that tracks what each of those values is called. Uh, yes, like it has, yeah, it needs that. It's um, yeah, it's a secondary data structure and it's not, it's technically, it's actually, it's a tree. Um, okay. uh, but yeah, they need that because um, uh, if you insert at position 10, then that'll change. It, like, you know, my, my position 10 might be different from your position 10. So the OT's answer is to convert, like transform the operations by each other. Um, CIDT is like what image um, have a unique ID. So this operation will never have to change no matter what concurrent edits happen. And that's okay. why they do it that way. That helps. Thanks. Yeah, Seth is correct about that, of course. Um, and to kind of visualize it for you, if you imagine uh, an array um, all of the elements in it are going to have various IDs like this. Like, let's say there's an array and 12 different people inserted stuff into the array, um, and it was all of their first operation. Then all of the elements are going to look like one at, and then some actor ID that's some random ID. And you also have basically 12 different actor IDs. And so there's no numerical relationship between any of the elements. They're just in order. If you want to insert after any particular one of them, well, you got to get its ID, and then that's how you insert after it. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and everything has an ID, and when it's inserted, that's the ID that it gets. So this, this thing that we're inserting, we're inserting the value 
H, that value H has an ID and its ID will be 13 at ABC2 because that's the, that's the, that's the ID of this operation. And so if anyone else wanted to insert something after this H that we are inserting here, uh, they would have 13 at ABC2 as the element ID. Um, PRED is, <clears throat> stands for predecessor, and these are things, these are IDs of things that are removed because of this action. Now, when we're inserting something, we never remove anything. Uh, but if we weren't inserting something, if we were setting something, then I, I don't know why they have this, but this would, this would tell us what's no longer there because we set this thing to be there instead. All right. Um, so now we're going to convert this into a braid message. Um, so here's some JSON. This is pseudocode because there's a couple of functions in here that don't actually exist. We'll get to those in a moment. Uh, so the version, the version we can use the hash. Um, this it will be different for every. Um, it'll be different for every change, and it has th these dependencies which are uh, similar in spirit to our um, parents. These are things that must exist in the data structure before it makes sense to insert this thing. Um, in principle, it can be more things than that. Um, uh, with AutoMerge here, you have some flexibility actually with what you decide to have as your dependencies. Um, but you'll have to make it be um, consistent with the, the patches, which we'll see here. So to create the patches, we want to take all of the ops and we, know we want to modify each of the ops in some way to make it a braid patch. And here's the modification. Uh, we start, so a patch at the end of the day, a patch is going to have two values. It'll have a range and it'll have a value. The range says what we're going to edit, the value says what we're going to make it be. Um, to start off the range, so a, um, a braid range is going to have a, a JSON path to the thing that we're going to modify. AutoMerge also has JSON. And so in principle, uh, we could find a path uh, to the object that we are going to modify. Um, this, I don't think this function exists in AutoMerge, but in principle, the data is there. It is an object. I mean, it is a JSON object. We know this, this object must exist in it somewhere. And so it'll have some path to where it is. If we are inserting in braid land, the way insertions are done at the end of the day is that we're going to have a part of the patch is going to have brackets, but it's going to be, it's going to have two numbers in it with a colon in, this, in between that specifies a range that we're going to be modifying. Since we're inserting something that, <clears throat> that range is going to be small, it's going to be some number colon that same number again because we're kind of, it's a single spot that we're inserting. We could be replacing a bunch of stuff, but um, AutoMerge never does replace operations. And so the insert will just have, it'll just be at a single spot and it'll be wherever we, wherever we determine that the element ID is within the object. Because again, AutoMerge, so we're saying what object we're gonna modify and then it's, that's the object and then the element within that object um, again, I don't know why it needs both of these because it could, in principle, it seems like it just needs the element ID. But in any case, um, that gives us our range if we're inserting something, but if we're not inserting something, then uh, we're, we have brackets just around a single number and that is um, the braid equivalent of setting that element. Um, which could be an array element or it could be an object element. You know, it could be a string key of something. Um, so when this says get key of, that's why, that's why I said get key of, because it could be in principle a string. Um, although it could be an array <laughs> as well. Like this could be an index just the same as this could be an index because again, this is inserting something at some index location, but AutoMerge allows you to set an element that's sitting in an array as well. Um, Anyway, if I, it is, yeah. So um, 
I think what we're doing, what we're doing here is creating this range for where the thing's inserted. And yeah. we're using, we're setting the range using the JSON equals range unit. And that's um, just to be clear, this is just one of the braid range. This is just one range format. This isn't, you know, any anything special in braid, but it's a it's maybe a, a, a common one so far. But we could also if it's easier, and we could have just have an auto merge style range here, that would just be like the L the LMID directly, and that would still be okay. Or you, we could also have a custom patch format. Yeah, I guess the the pros and cons of that would be um, if you wanted someone else who spoke Braid but didn't speak auto merge in particular, um, if you used a uh, a custom auto merge path, then they might not uh, know how to talk to it at all. Whereas if you use a JSON patch, then they will know how to talk to it a bit. They won't know how to talk to it perfectly, of course, because there's still the, the merge conflict resolution. But um, yeah. But Mike is right. This is using the JSON patch, and it doesn't it doesn't have to. This is um, this is what you would. Uh, Kind of the, the purpose of this, um, assuming that we're all familiar with the JSON patch, uh, this should tell us all what, um, give us all a better feeling for what AutoMerge is doing in terms of something that we know about already. Um, so the second half, if this is the, the first half, so this is dealing with the range and the second half is gonna deal with the value. Um, if it's an insert, um, so both of these do the same thing with the value. They just take the value from the op and they stringify it. But if it is um, an insert, then we put brackets around it. Again, that's just how the braid JSON, I would say the, the, the JSON path which is not related to braid, although it is being introduced by us, <laughs> by the braid people. Um, if you're, if we're, inserting something into an array, we have brackets around it because the thing that you're inserting could be a bunch of things. Um, anyway, so then it returns the patch. So that's- um, um, Just a quick question, Greg, for clarification. This, yeah. this uh, braid set operation that you have, the whole thing, um, is this assuming, um, I guess, an array uh, set? <clears throat> Um, like sorry. other things that you might want to set would include, for example, a key on an object, right? Oh uh, yeah, this includes a key on an object. So let me, uh, oh, okay. let me kind of restate it as if it was surely a key on an object that was being modified. And I'll, I'll restate this briefly here. So imagine that this is not an array insertion. This is a, a set on an object. What ops here is gonna be, this is gonna be the ID of the object that we're setting. And this is going to be, I need to look at this, but I'm pretty sure this is the ID of the element within that object, basically the key of that object that we're setting. Um, but I need to look at that because I am, let me make sure about that. <laughs> um, but for now, uh, For now, assume it's true <laughs> for the sake of understanding this some of that. I, um, I'm just thinking now that I'm not uh, that I'm not actually sure. I, I was assuming all of this time up until this moment that it was, but as I think about sorry, it, sorry, sorry. What was the question? So the question is, if you want to insert something, if you want to set a key in an object, uh, how is that mm -hmm. different? Like I had been talking about setting mm -hmm. inserting something into an array. How is it different if you set a key of an object? And I'm saying the, uh, I'm pretty sure it's basically the same. The object here is gonna be the object that you're setting. The element is gonna be, it's gonna basically refer to the key. This is again, the thing that I'm not completely sure about, but I think it refers to the key in the object that you're setting. The action is gonna be yeah. set and insert is gonna be false. And the value is gonna be whatever the right hand side of that equality is, the thing that you're putting into that object. And pred is gonna be whatever was at that key before you made this set. And if we convert it over here, the range 
this is still going to be the JSON path to that object within the JSON. Uh, insert will be false. And so the last part of the range is just going to be the, the key of this element, which is just the last part of the JSON path. And we have the object and now we need the, the final you know, dot key. Um, and then we'll be setting it to um, equal the, the value of the, of the patch is this the value. Um, is that satisfactory, <laughs> Duane? Does it, does yes, it? yeah, that does clarify a lot. Thank you. I understand the, uh, the different cases in this now uh, quite cool. a bit better. <laughs> Great. Uh, and it's kind of tempting to think that the different cases distinguish between array versus object, uh, but that's not quite true because, again, you can set an element of an array as opposed to just insert something into the array. Um, but the inserts only matter in arrays. You never see an insert in an object. Um, anyway, so that converts all of the <clears throat> all of the ops into patches, uh, with the you know caveat that it it's pulling out these JSON paths, and so um, when it's received on the other end, it's going to need to convert those JSON paths back into references to the object. Um, but you can do that. Um, so this is, this is retaining all of the information and it allows it to be deconstructed and reconstructed. There is some information that it loses, um, but that is retained here in, this is not the correct name for this, but there, um, when we were talking about this in JSON, we had some name, but I, I forget what it was, but the, um, but the HTTP version of this, I, um, I'm not, I'm not sure what the current plan here is, but in principle, you can just add whatever headers you want. And you could imagine that this is just a, a user defined header that's sitting on all of these patches. Um, well, this one would be sitting at the, you know, there's the main, <laughs> the way these messages work, there's a, the main message and it has a bunch of patches that are kind of like mini messages. This would all be in the main message. It'd be like another header, like amazon.x, that's just something that, um, and the things that it has are literally just all the stuff that didn't fit into here, all the stuff that's not used except by AutoMerge specifically. So the actor and the sequence, those aren't used as, used, you know, as far as braid is concerned, they're, they're hidden from it. They're just, they're in this hash somehow and in these dependencies. But AutoMerge itself needs to know these things. The start up again, <laughs> um, it needs to know the startup because these patches have IDs and those IDs reference the startup. And so if you wanna, if you're auto merge and you want your IDs to be correct, then you need the startup. Same with the time and the message. These, you know, they're not useful for anything except auto merge. If you're an auto merge person, then you want your commit messages. And then this uh, op extras, this is extra information for each of the ops. And the information that we're missing from there are these predecessors. Braid doesn't have a notion of a thing that was there before that you deleted. And so I'm just adding these here. Um, in any case, that's, uh, that's nearly um, complete, I claim. I haven't actually run this code because I haven't implemented this function. But, the, um, but there is something that I know that's missing. And that is, in particular, this. Uh, there are text objects within AutoMerge. AutoMerge, unlike Sync9 and unlike YJS, I think, uh, AutoMerge makes has two kinds of strings that can exist in the JSON structure. One is a regular old string that has no extra meta information at all. It's basically an atomic unit, and the other one is a text object, which is under the hoods in a, a list, uh, an AutoMerge list of characters, and if you do something like uh, have a value in it and you set it equal and this op thing here is a string, you need to know whether it's a text object string or a regular atomic unit string. And um, we don't have a way inside of a braid JSON path to make that distinction. So in order to do that distinction at the moment, we would have to, um, we can either put it down here as an op extra for that operation uh, or have or not use 
JSON is a, an auto merge specific thing, but that is a, um, a bit of information that's not here that I wanna alert you all to. Um, and also uh, um, counters uh, are also not in here. Um, hmm. Another thing to be aware of, this second paragraph is talking about um, in auto merge, uh, it does something a little bit different than what uh, it makes a, so when Mike and I were thinking about like, we have a set of, we have a version and we have a set of patches that modify that version. There's a question about whether those patches know about each other or not. You can imagine a set of patches that kind of build on each other. Like let's say you type in 10 characters, you can imagine each of those characters building on each other. Now, um, we made the decision to say, well, um, those can always be collapsed down. Like you're never gonna have to have stuff that needs to build on itself when you're sending somebody a new version. All of the things that look like they build on themselves, you could just collapse down into a single thing if you wanted to. And so we made it so that all of our patches reference the original version without knowing about each other. And so in particular, if there are two inserts and this one is into position 10, and this one is into position 20, then those numbers 10 and 20 refer to positions in the original array. They don't, like the position 20 should not include the added length that the array will get once you insert the things at position 10. Auto merge is different. It makes the other assumption. It assumes that ops do build on each other and you can have ops in this list that reference other ops in this list. And, and you might say, well, we can just, we don't have to worry about that because we can always compress them down. Uh, but that's not true in auto merge because auto merge, uh, all characters in an array of text are separate elements. And so if you want to insert five characters, one after the other, they all have to reference the previous one. You can't just have an insert that has a value with five letters in it because that is going to be interpreted as a atomic unit string, not as a um, the kind of thing that we want. They may, because they're working on this, and I, um, they may make ops themselves that kind of uh, compress in that way. I suspect that they're trying to do that. And they may already have yeah, it. They've, they've got some prototype code that does it, um, and it's particularly important for compression. Yeah. So the run like encoding stuff does that. And they kind of have columnar stores of this, so you can say value H E L L O, and then have some compacted binary form of the of the sequence um, set and the parents, since it compresses nicely. But yeah, right, cool. Um, in any case, it's not something that we. It's not a. It's not a showstopper. Uh, this is something to be aware of because we can even if they don't do the compression, we can we can do the compression and uncompression ourselves in an intermediate layer. Um, but we can also um, just translate it into a form and then, un and then we're, like uh, if we translate it into indices or something, then when we can translate it back on the other side, we can add in those backlinks if, if they're deterministic. That's exactly then, right. Sorry, that's, um, that's, what I was, that's what I was intending to say when we can oh. do it in our own layer. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm still I'm still skeptical about that implementation, that okay. being a reasonable choice. I would I, I think uh, that would be really complicated. Um, and, and, well, this and is another, a perfect time to hear your skepticism because we're at the end of this thing. I'd love to go ahead, Mike and, and Seth. Okay. Um, there's, there's a few different ways to handle it. One way is to chunk them all together, like chunk many edits or many patches into a single patch that's longer. Another way is to give each patch some insertion point that still produces the same thing and then rewrite them afterwards. And then another way is to break them up into multiple versions that are allowed to refer to previous patches. And I, yeah. I can see all of those. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts, Seth? So yeah, well, see. multiple versions, I think is a bit of a non-starter because that breaks up transactions. So we can no longer have transactions if my transaction has to be broken into separate versions. Like, so long as that's the unit of a transaction, I think that's problematic. Um, the mapping between locations and version IDs. Um, I mean, the problem with that is that uh, 
is that if so in my local client i've made a bunch of uh, i've made some changes the server doesn't know about yet so the server tells me an operation and says hey this insert happened at position 10. so now i have to in my local image i have to figure out what version 10 sorry what position 10 matches into because obviously position 10 is not going to be position 10 locally it's going to be position 10 before some set of changes that I know about that the server doesn't yet know about have landed. And that implementation is, um, you know, if it's 10, it's like, oh, it's fine. I'll just count forward 10 operations and filter out any, like throw out any, any uh, inserts that the server doesn't know about. But if we're talking about like, you know, position 10,000 um, in a bigger list, then uh, implementing that in an efficient way requires like a specialized B tree and anyway, I like I can imagine an efficient implementation, but I think it'll be very complicated to implement efficiently. And um, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's easier just to use the CIT identifiers as location identifiers. Um, I, I hear you on that. I think that it. Um, I don't think it's less efficient than order n, where n is the number of uh, elements in AutoMerge. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, but I think it is at least that. If you want to do something better than that, then you need some fancy data structure. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, but you're right. Yeah, and what that, uh, we can achieve uh, perfection by getting rid of by not using the JSON thing and just using the actual uh, element IDs of auto merge. Yeah, I, I also think like I think someone interpreting auto merge changes is going to need an implementation of auto merge anyway. At the point they've got an implementation of auto merge, then they may as well just, you know, like use auto merge offsets, uh, use auto merge parents. Um, it, yeah, well, that seems like a, yeah, a lot of complexity. I, I could imagine like a client that doesn't do writes, just purely consuming the stream of changes. And for that client wanting to consume a stream of changes that use offsets. And for that, you wouldn't need any of the extra logic. So it might make sense to have an implementation supporting that um, just for like, I want to follow this text document and then you know, then I can just consume the offsets and the server can easily calculate the offsets. Just from its point of view, there's no, you know, time offsetting it needs to do, but yeah. Yeah, to echo that, Seth, I mean, I kind of had a similar, um, this is kind of a, a debate I've had back and forth with Mike for a while, um, mm. but I had a new insight into Mike's thinking about this. I had, it, it always bothered me to try to put these different protocols, these different like YGS and AutoMerge onto the same protocol because they're not going to merge the same. <laughs> right. However, um, I think Mike, and I can see the argument for this, uh, thinks that there's some value in failing to merge perfectly uh, for just the reason that you said that you could have a thing that's talking auto merge and it can talk auto merge perfectly to its auto merge brethren, but you have some new client and it wants to connect. It doesn't speak auto merge, but it can still get some value, not perfect value, it's not going to do everything perfectly, but it can get some and quite a bit uh, just by throwing things in uh, based on offsets and things aren't going to merge correctly because it doesn't know how to sort things to get inserted into the same offset. But that text or you know whatever it is that you're merging will have some information. Um, and to the, and anyway, and just that, that there's, um, uh, there's some value, perhaps, in imperfect merging. And that was a big switch for me. I, I hadn't, it just seemed to me that there's no value in imperfect merging. But, uh, but I can, um, I think Mike is interested in imperfect merging. I can see some value in imperfect merging. And yet, the, in order to see the value of doing this, um, for me, I think it helps to see, to decide that um, sure, it'd be some value for somebody to merge this imperfectly. And the moment that there is value there, then, then there's value in having a kind of halfway thing where it, it really is, um, you can use it in this simpler way and you'll get some value from it, but you're definitely missing some things. Uh, but you can get that value. You could write a very simple client that would, um, you could write a little uh, command line utility in Python in a, in a few moments that would give you a rough view of what was going on in that data structure. Uh, yeah, maybe. Really I mean, like the, the benefit. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll just I'll be brief. 
I'm really excited for this uh, work, Greg, because um, I think it's helping to assign costs to different things. Like how much does it cost in memory or time to merge, you know, in a universal language versus, you know, we specialize and, and do auto merge, uh, you know, together, all the auto merge clients can do their auto merge thing. Um, uh, it's been very murky in my mind as well, like uh, how we could accomplish that. And um, now I'm starting to see like, yeah, so we can get some benefit, but also it's going to have costs. And so I'm excited to find out what those costs are. I think that's a good point. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, the, the trade-off you're talking about, Greg, is that um, for clients that don't want to have an auto merge implementation, they can do some stuff, right? The, the downside is they don't get correct merging and the upside is they don't need auto merge. I think yeah. I would prefer to pour engineering effort into making it so that having a simple auto merge implementation is just a very low cost. Um, that's my preferred way to approach things, but yeah. I can see that, although I would, um, this would be a, a running discussion, I guess. How, how, sure. sim how simple can we make implementing a, a CRDT that does actual honest to God, perfect merging? Well, I had a chat with Martin about it and he reckons if, if, if you were to throw our optimization out the window, he's got an implementation of auto merge that sits in about three or 400 lines of code. Um, the question is just like, if you want to make it be efficient and so on, then, you know, I believe, then, I, yeah. I believe three or 400. Um, I think that you could, I think that you could assimilate incorrectly uh, text based on offsets in less than a hundred lines of code. So I think it is simpler yeah. <laughs> than with yeah. And perhaps higher that. performance than the simple auto merge. Maybe. I mean, like if you're only accepting reads, um, I, I don't know, like I guess my, the shelling point places that I'd imagine code coalescing is like read only implementation that does not need to understand auto merge, just gets offsets, can work with any any system, but it's just read only. And then another one, which is like a full peer that does auto merge that has an auto merge implementation, pulls in the, you know, the WASM implementation of auto merge and then can handle, you know, reads and does writes. Um, I'm hearing that like you guys describing another place that you'd like to see, which is, does merge is doesn't have auto merge just is wrong sometimes and uh, like my instinct is I never want that like I you know there's a, <laughs> there's so much right. software that's wrong already that I don't want to be adding more wrong software to the world right. um, so that's that's like my <laughs> feeling but if you guys think that's useful then sure I don't think I'm going to convince you of it <laughs> well I do just observe that um, empirically every popular chat application that I've seen does not merge consistently. If two people send two messages at the same time, they'll come in a different orders. And it doesn't seem to be hurting their bottom line or really impacting the user experience enough for them to fix it. And so I, I, I think I, I see a lot of applications in which perfect merges aren't, seem, doesn't seem to be what people care about. Sure, yeah, I, I believe you. And I, I just don't, I think if we're gonna go to the effort of making a correct implementation, I don't think we really, you know, gain that much by throwing correctness away once we've done the engineering effort to get it. Um, that's my take on it. Well, let me uh, let me kind of summarize this by let me um, reach consensus by backtracking a bit on saying that it's uh, that it's valuable to merge imperfectly, and rather say that there may be value in merging imperfectly. And if we want to, here's how you can do it with auto merge. Sure. Sane, be forgiving with what you receive and the opposite or something. Just <laughs> as you're building a specification, should be forgiving, I think, even if it might not look right. So I feel I feel that what, what Michael is saying. Cool. Anyway, I'll uh, um, end here. Note that um, you could uh, particularly for Seth, this as a, um, this could be <laughs> uh, done in a perfect way, but we currently would not with JSON, we'd have to, um, I mean, frankly, it could, you could just use this, you just wouldn't want to um, trust any clients that weren't also reading in this uh, extra auto merge information and doing the correct thing with it. Yeah, so, yeah, and I think this is a, might actually, as I said, I hadn't thought of that, but I think this is a great approach if you just wanted to have a read-only client, um, you know, because uh, then you don't need a lot of this other stuff. Cool. 
but in any case, um, part of this for me is this kind of a interesting exercise to understand auto merge better. I, people here have various understandings of auto merge. I've you know I've known about it. I know it's a CRDT. I know roughly how it works. But um, anyway, now I have a, a somewhat better understanding of its internals and seeing how they could, in theory, be mapped onto braid. If nothing else, is a way of structuring in my mind what what's going on with auto merge. Um, and this, I want to, I want to point this out again, just to, because it's it was, um, it wasn't obvious to me at first. There's a these IDs here, this number. When you create a new operation, the number that you use for it, the number that you're going to put as this start up, is going to be a number that is one bigger than any of the numbers that you have seen anywhere. But not so with this number. This sequence number is just a regular incrementing sequence. Um, so I just want to reiterate, these, these actor sequence IDs are different than these actor sequence IDs. And these are the real ones. These are the ones that, uh, that identify everything. everything every, every element in the, in the auto merge data structure has a, a unique actor sequence of this form. Um, that, and these you could just ignore. They don't appear anywhere as far as I can tell. Anyway. So Greg, to clarify that last point then, are you saying that after this auto merge change is applied, if we wanted a subsequent auto merge change, then the OBJ value would be, would have to be at least 14 at ABC2? Uh, uh, Yes, but not the OBJ value, because again, this is not the ID of this of this operation. This is the ID of the parent that this operation is going to insert something into. The ID of this operation here is ABC two thirteen. I right. mean thir thirteen at ABC two. We should move on to running well on time, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but thank you. I'm really excited to see these guts. I know we just got really technical, um, but I also through these technical guts, we're going to learn how much our how much compatibility we can get across synchronizers, which is a very interesting and intense question. And so it's cool that we're looking into that. And Seth, are you ready to give your demo? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, yeah, when I think about auto, um, braid and all of this stuff, I kind of think about there's this aspect that I don't think we have been talking about much. I, I really want computing to look different. So I think it's ridiculous. We still use file systems. I think file systems are the wrong abstraction for users. Um, I think a file in general is a binary set of bytes that we have the operations of overriding some bytes non-atomically um, just isn't the right abstraction for the 21st century. Uh, and you see, and I think it's, I, 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 there's a blog post in me that I want to write now. Um, that it's interesting that we moved from a file system where I've got Finder and I've got a folder full of files and those files are heterogeneous. Like I've got some, you know, documents in there and I've got some text files and I've got some, uh, um, I've got some PDFs and I've got a bunch of different content to uh, a phone. And on my phone, I have, um, I've just got a big billboard of, of company logos. So the, the first order, it, it's like, we've gone from, the primary tool, like the primary unit of abstraction being some data, some content. And then inside that content, I might have multiple tools interacting with that content. So for example, if I've got a text file, I might open it in my text editor, or I might grep uh, and use grep to search for something. Or I might do a word count using the word count tool, or I might send it to somebody. I might email it to another person, put it on a USB key, um, or I might move it to a different folder, or I might rename it. Um, there's a whole lot of different operations I would do with that piece of content. Now, instead we have you know, we're slowly moving across, and I don't think anyone decided this, to this application-oriented world where um, if I've got a bunch of heterogeneous data, I've got information about my tags. I might have some Google Docs. I might have some emails. I might have some PDFs that are on my on disk. I might have some, you know, a, a user account on my government's, uh, you know, the Australian tax office's website. And all of these different kinds of data are all, like, the first, the first question is, what platform are they in? And then once I know what platform they're in, then each kind of data has its completely different semantics. And I can't use any tool that shares between the semantics of these things. So I've been thinking a bit about like what would a 
what would a data first world look like uh, if we could bring freight into it? And, um, and so I, I just want to like share some ideas that I've been having about this. So I've been thinking about this question of, um, you know, like what would a UI look like? And then, you know, if I riff off Finder, I can imagine something like this. Uh, so this is sort of my, you know, thrown together idea of an equivalent version of, you know, like ProcFS and all these kind of things. So I've got some folder system state, I've got my CPU, I've got my devices, processes, and network information. You know, I can click on my CPU, I can see information about the, the temperature. And then there's some data here, which is JSON. And that, that JSON of data, um, it could be rendered in a couple of different ways. Either it can be rendered as JSON or it can be rendered as some sort of view, which is application specific. And then also this JSON data is updated using braid. So instead of just like a byte range changing or having to write a script that pulls proxysfs or something to find out changes, instead I could have an application just subscribe to the data object that exists in this location on my computer. And then I'll just find out all the changes that happen. And they could be versioned or non-versioned. They could be read like they could be read only in this case, so they could be read write, they could be peer to peer, they could be owned by a single writer. Um, we can have a bunch of properties of this. And then like the idea would be that then we can have custom views. So, um, so just to like explore this a little bit. Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry. And every object could also have a, a URL. So I want to be able to right click and say like share an external link to this particular object. And then I can give that to, to Dwayne. And if that link contains information about like access control rights, then he can click on that link and put it on his folder and he can be able to see my CPU temperature because the URL refers to my CPU temperature. Um, and then I was thinking about, right, like what else could you put in here? So for example, I might have local devices. So I've got uh, an ubiquity setup. So maybe I click on my router and inside my router, I can see uh, information about the configuration, the status. And again, we've got JSON information and also Unify, like the company that makes ubiquity gear or ubiquity, I can't remember what, which way around those two words go. Um, they could make their own UI. So they could express how the information about this configuration JSON object turns into a UI that lets me interact with that configuration information. Um, but I can also just see the JSON version of it as well and be able to interact in that way. Um, you know, another example would be uh, my bank accounts. So maybe I've got a bank you know, account with Westpac Bank, which is a big Australian bank. Uh, well, my bank as well could provide all that information about my bank, about my transactions as JSON. And also the bank could provide a UI to be able to, to render those transactions, um, show them to me, let me interact with them um, and be able to you know, have certain actions and so on. And the idea with this kind of thing is that um, if I want to write scripts to be able to you know, read all my bank transactions, I can just do that because my script can access the JSON directly. Or if Mike wants to have a different UI for some tool that he uses or wants to change the code, well, he can just pull the code for the view and then change the view itself to be able to represent the additional kind of data that uh, he wants to show. Um, and like, to me, this is, this is how I think how computers should work. I, you know, we've kind of got these weird like levels of abstraction at the moment. We've got our OS, we've got file system on top of file systems, we build databases, but all the databases are different and support different protocols. And then on top of those, we build applications. And now we're so idiomatic, so idiomatic with the kind of data this particular application cares about that two applications can't talk to each other anymore. And I, I think that's something I really want to change. Um, that's a contribution I'd love to make. Um, and of course, if we used URLs for all of this stuff uh, or something like it, then these objects themselves can link to one another. Um, and yeah, and so I've been thinking about that as well and like thinking about what a container could look like if it was a, you know, a construct which we would support like peer-to-peer -peer editing of all of the data inside this, this game and so on. Um, but I briefly want to show, um, so yesterday, uh, no one's seen this yet. This is, uh, this is new to everybody. Um, I threw together a little mock-up of what this could look like. So. So this is a little um, little Svelte app that's showing a mock-up of the same thing that I was just showing. So I've got system and inside that, I've got different aspects inside my system. So I can see my CPU and I've got information about my CPU. And of course, I don't have a view for this. So this is just JSON. But um, if I look at my temperature, then I can see the temperature of my CPU. And this isn't, you'll notice the UI here looks different. This is a custom view that the CPU temperature could provide saying, hey, uh, this is how I turn into HTML. Or this is how I turn into pixels or something like that. And of course, I can just click across to seeing the JSON of it, but um, both of these are showing the same information just through two different ways. Um, and the idea here is then, of course, like I could see things on my network, I could see my projects and things like that. Um, and I can also, I set it up so that I can also see, say, the time. So this is connected to a real braid object. So we can see the URL of the braid object it's connecting to, um, which is a simple little example. Um, and I can see here the, um, the value of this object changing over time. Of course, I've had a view for this then I could have a clock and the clock would move and so on. Um, and 
all of these folders look like folders, but actually secretly these are just JSON objects too. So that's just a, a list of objects and each one has a label and a URL. Um, and I can switch back and forth between the view showing it as a, as a, a folder like view because that's the view of a, a list of things or I can show it as just what the JSON looks like. And I could imagine, um, you know, for example, scanning through or if we knew the schema for this also having URLs be clickable and being able to show another pane or have, um, you know, a custom object that then, you know, so if this is a custom view, then I could still be able to click on things in here and then show other panes or do other kinds of things in the user interface. Um, but yeah. Uh, that's really that's cool. I like this demo. <laughs> Thanks. Um, is, I do as well. is there a, is there a way to uh, freeze a version or, or maybe even have you given any thought to freezing a version and sharing the frozen version? Like, uh, or, like I imagine there are some cases where you, you may have a document that's being updated live. Maybe all your mm -hmm. coworkers are working on it, but you want to make sure that you're sharing this, like, you know, two weeks ago, last Friday's version with the bank or something like that. Right. Yeah. I haven't given that much thought yet. I mean, yeah, I, I feel like I feel there's a bunch of semantics that we want to fit in here. It's like, suddenly <laughs> we can go past files. There's a bunch of extra Yay. semantics that I want, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, that we can have. I mean, like, let me share again that little, um, my little sketch out in Monitor. Uh, so I was thinking for, you know, like if I have a project, like a source code project, I've got kind of these source code files, right? Which are just themselves. If I click on one of these, I could see the source code of that file. Um, but also there's sort of this meta information about the container. Um, so I could imagine, I mean, like, I would love to, like, I want to have a tool where I can have like a, which is a little database that does peer-to-peer -peer replication, um, kind of like uh, Redwood, but also have branches in it. So from that perspective, I think that like maybe each document in each branch has a unique URL. So we can make a, you know, master branch slash, you know, my file or like um, uh, Seth's, Seth's local branch slash some file and have those as separate URLs. So if I want to share a link to a particular document inside a branch, I should be able to do that. But um, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know how to answer your question, except for that, like, I, I support that as a feature. And um, yeah, I think it, I think there's something, uh, if idiomatic is the right word, like application specific about how applications should be able to turn a document into your URL and have different semantics for different kinds of things. So my CPU temperature, like my CPU doesn't know what the temperature was two weeks ago. It just might not be storing that. So if you want to share a link to that, Maybe you have to copy it or make a snapshot of it or something. Maybe we can have some standard tooling around that. So I say like, hey, take this object and freeze it. And then that creates a new object just with a copy of the data in that moment, point in time. Um, but then if we've got a complicated peer-to-peer -peer database that does replication and has branches and has full history, then yeah, I mean like that, that database itself would provide URLs, um, which would let other people be able to, um, uh, you, know, you know, link to them. And then that URL should be able to uh, last a long time. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I think I'm shorter. I, I don't know that. Um, I was just going to say that the uh, um, copying for for Dwayne when I when I think about that use case for these kinds of things, like if I'm working with a Google Doc and I want to save a version of that Google Doc, or I'm pair programming with my with one of my nephews and I want to save what that code looks like so that I can get back to it after I talk to my other nephew and the code has all been destroyed. Um, I just copy it, <laughs> I copy it into a new, a new space, which in this world would be a new JSON space. Currently, it's a new file. But um, anyway, so for that copying, I think um, my other comment. I just wanted to say uh, I'm also really on board with JSON for everything. I feel like, roughly speaking, a kind of transition that I that I see and welcome in computing is uh, files were kind of the thing at some point, and files are great, but I. Uh, I think that JSON is better. I think it's better for a lot of things. I think there are actually, for, for binary data, I don't think it's better. But, but I actually, I kind of like the view of having JSON for everything. And if you need binary data and it's small, just put it in the JSON. And if it's big, then have a link in the JSON to it and have the binary stored in a, in a file. But, <laughs> but the JSON, it, I just wish my computer was accessible in that way where everything was kind of exposed as, as JSON that I could just write 
in the same way as Unix, where everything is exposed as a file, and you know they get a lot of power from that. There are all kinds of Unix commands that take in files that like the process list file. Um, but as JSON, it's just so much easier to munge the information that is currently kind of trapped within the files. Like you get the file, but then you have to parse the file. Each file has its own format. Anyway, one thing that this is bringing up in me, both in what you're describing, Greg, and also Seth, like the whole kind of implicit in this is you're like, this is how I want computing to be. And I think it's not just how Seth wants it to be, but this is like, as a user, like the computer is an extension of my mind. And this interface is like, uh, this is your little world that you get to create. You're organizing your data in a certain way here. But what's really radically new about this is that you can organize your data in some way, but also every piece of data in here has a URL. And so it's easy to instantly share with other people or other or share with apps. Like, and the, to think that my bank accounts information, like you had, if you scroll up here, mm. um, there, yeah, you've got your bank account, like in your file system, like in your own organization. <laughs> this is the most inaccessible data that I <laughs> often experience. And so in doing that, then you can also like have your transactions um, and maybe you could have that interface with someone else. They can have their own interpretation of it. But like, if I have a business, I'm gonna write up an invoice for a customer and then they're gonna like pay that invoice. And then we're both gonna keep track of this transaction in our own systems. And we might get some discrepancy because I have to have somebody like manually read this invoice thing and then type it into a computer when we could just have our computers talk to each other if we have our own internal state in a way that's shareable with others and this also gets to like one of the biggest problems that i encounter with file systems on computers is okay you've got a computer up our computers in the same room i want to put a file onto yours how the heck do i do that <laughs> it's like oh, oh, i'm going to email it to you or something <laughs> and then like manually drag and drop again so this feels like a, a radical shift in, in perspective where we can organize all of our data however we want and also share it with each other. And then we can have computational interfaces between these things that are like Greg's saying, like really easy to do because it's all just some JSON and it's already structured. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I absolutely agree. I, like, I feel like there's a few big advantages to this. And like one of them is, uh, is that we've got this kind of semantic information um, like everything can be JSON. Another one is we've got um, like having changes as like a semantic change, like here's a patch, here's a patch, here's a patch, or like here's a new version, here's a new version, means that suddenly we can have interactive user interfaces that update <laughs> as the value itself changes. And then like, then there's this other really big piece, which is suddenly um, we can build these state machines. Like I've got a state machine that's describing my data now. Well, I can share a state machine because if you follow all the actions that happen and you understand what those actions are, you can have an exact copy of like a replica of the state of the data. And that's really easy to share and really easy to distribute. It's easy to reason about. It's easy to tell whether it's working correctly or not. And it means that we can have stuff like this where, yeah, if my bank account, you know, I've got like my, my checking account and then I've got a list of transactions and I could just like take the transaction where, you know, I paid you for something or other, like I, you know, and, and I could share that particular transaction with you. And then your URL would be coming from Westpac Bank and it would say like, and it would be, you know, your access credentials could be specific to that particular object of this transaction. So you can say, yes, you know, Westpac has, you know, like the state of this transaction is that it's it's gone through or whatever it is. And, um, you know, if the state of the transaction is that it got um, got rolled back or if something happened, if it's a credit card transaction, then you can also see that because the object that you have, you can just subscribe to the changes to it. Uh, and I think, yeah, I'm just saying, yes. But yeah, uh, I think it's a really powerful view of the world. I just want to, this is an incredible editor. I haven't seen this before. Oh yeah, it's, it's good fun. I can like, yeah, make some different shapes and I can okay. you know, draw little lines between them. I love it. Making them and yeah. Um, I think the guy who made it stopped working on it because not enough people bought it. Um, <laughs> it's unfortunate. Yeah, but it's good fun. Uh, yeah, quick question for you. Yeah. Seth, um, what, uh... Uh, oh, first of all, um, is the uh, uh, the toy app that you just showed us is that um, is that read only at this point? 
Uh, yes, I haven't implemented writing in it. I, I, I made it yesterday. Like it, yeah, yeah, it's very, very cool. No, no, I, yeah, um, I just wanted to check in. You, you can't edit the CPU temperature. You can't make it. I can't edit the CPU temperature. Actually, even the CPU temperature is a lie. This is this is just using local data, uh, hard coded. It's not. This isn't actually connecting to um, an object. I was thinking, Dwayne, that it would be great to pull in your code that's done the CPU temperature stuff. Cool. You know, have a nice little dial here. I was like, ah, could I easily throw something up? Ah, but um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Your house is getting cold. You can crank it up, or uh, <laughs> if you want to be on uh, San Francisco time, you can just edit that that time, and we're all good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, like, I how to manage like read-only views or editable views, and you know, like, if I've got like I could imagine as well the object expressing a way to have um, uh, have actions or something, like, which is sort of interesting. Like, I I can very much imagine having like in my head the way I'm imagining doing this is. Uh, we pull down the data and then the data also has a URL that says, hey, my scheme is over here. And that's another URL. And if you pull that down, it says like, here's a link to the views. Here's information about whether it's read only or read write. Here's you know, a bunch of extra metadata. Um, like, and I'm not sure if that's the right way to do it. Uh, and so it's like, oh, great. Okay, so this part in here is actually a link. And I know to click on that, that'll take me to the link. And this other part here is, you know, um, it's JSON, but it's, it's formatted as a calendar card. So. If I know how to render calendar cards, I should be able to like pop in a, a UI for that. Um, but I could also imagine having like a list of actions or something. So if it was a specific state machine, like um, if I had a, a pending bank transaction, right? So I typed in some information about a bank transaction. I could have an action, which is tell the bank to send this money, you know? And then my UI, I, you know, could like even the, the default, like JSON UI could have some like actions and I can click on those actions to say like, hey, I want to transition this object into this new state. Um, or something like that, which, yeah, I don't know. I've got way too many ideas on things that you could build on top of this that would be sweet. But yeah, um, yeah if you feel keen to like add read write, like add write support to this, then um, I'd love it. It's just all in GitHub. So yeah. Cool. I would use this app too. <laughs> so if you continue it. <laughs> sweet. That's, that's <laughs> actually, I mean, it's, it's great to hear. I actually would really want to like take the thing that you're working on, like take ribbon and then have like, have a you know have a folder which is like all the messages and be able to click on that and then just see all the messages in in ribbon and then click on one of them and see the JSON and and then Do like it. you could like go in and add a yes. message and it'll just pop in um that'd be really great I love it <laughs> yeah yeah I think you can do that uh, any view that you want to add to it I think we should we should experiment with trying different views on uh top of different you know data sets yeah awesome yeah let's totally do it uh can you hear me Seth yeah uh, yeah. So, wouldn't this be uh, like orders of magnitude slower than the current file system? Like, you're probably not going to uh, replace the, you know, things like APFS and whatnot. This would be like a layer on top of it, like an assessing layer on um, top of those things. There was an interesting uh, talk given by, God, I can never remember the name. It's like it was some American candy that I, can, I can't remember. Um, but Mike knows the guy. Uh, it's but he he basically remade a file system along similar lines, not from the perspective of having new features, but simply because he wanted file systems to work better with um, modern NVMe storage. And it turned out that if you structured file systems in a slightly different way um, that is incredibly compatible with this, then file systems also got faster. And he re-implemented um, SQLite and a couple other programs to use his file system instead of using the built-in ones. And not only did he have transactional support from the file system level, but also the applications got like 20, 30% faster. So, um, okay. yeah, I don't think there's any inherent reason why this would be any slower. Um, I think like obviously an early version of this, right? I'll throw it in LMDB or LevelDB or something and then make something that's in a self-contained isolate that you know sits on top of the file system. But ideally down the road, I would prefer to have an operating system where this was the first class citizen and then file systems built on top of this since this should support wow. transactions out of the box. I'd really like to know right. more. Can we just like name a whole bunch of American candies and you just thumbs up when we hit it? Right, Mike, can <laughs> you remember what it's called? Uh, <laughs> remember, was this the UC Santa Cruz guy? Yeah, I think so. There's only a few computer scientists at that school, so we could look up UC Santa Cruz. I, I might have a tab I, I, open somewhere. I, okay, I can find the link um, and send it in Discord afterwards. <laughs> cool. Uh, so another uh, question here there, well actually for that point there's a guy on github called uh groundwater and let me just show my screen he tried to implement a ground up operating system built in node.js 
Um, this is like going back five years ago or something like that. Um, so I think uh, in terms of a file system that is JSON, um, I can't find the repo, whatever, but it's probably worth reaching out to him. I remember he presented at one of the meetups I attended like five or so years ago. Um, for and, reference, like to be yeah. clear, I don't think a file system, I don't think this stuff at the ground level should be looking on Node.js. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why would it be slower than, than Apple APFS? <laughs> well, it would be slower if you build it in Node.js. Well, so don't right. build it in Node.js, right? Like <laughs> make it native. Um, yeah. Yeah. Rust is lovely. Yeah, I so I agree with that. Um, I, I can't find the the actual repo, whatever, maybe you took it down. Um, for the idea of uh, you could probably have it where apps like Twitter and whatnot, or your bank, right? Like app, you have uh, in the same way Apple, they have slash applications. You could probably do it whether it's Twitter or Westpac or whatnot, right? And then that actually exposes the API. And you could probably do this as a proxy layer, right? Like just boot up a node server initially that proxies your file system, then exposes everything over JSON. And then you write IAPI clients uh, for those different applications. Um, there's actually another service called uh, hook.io by Max Squires. He was one of the Nojitsu uh, co-founders, but he, this is very old. It was well, like five plus years old. Um, and he tried to kind of do like a API client for everything um, and then have more talking together, more modern uh, ways of doing this whole where, you know, your West back diet data is something you own uh, is, uh, block stack or stacks.co as well as textile. Are uh, they also looking at that self ownership government that's interoperable with uh, other apps as well? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, what uh, the like Tim Berners Lee and the sorry, I'm blanking. I had a lot of watch sleeps in my life. Solid, that's the one. Yeah, I had a terrible sleep last night, so I'm kind of <laughs> half out of it today. Uh, yeah, Solid's also doing something similar. Um, yeah, I, I, my preference is not IPFS and not blockchain and not a lot of these things. Like, I think there's a lot of data that just, it's like my CPU temperature doesn't need to be on the blockchain. It just needs to be local URL that has local data that changes over time. And, um, you know, and like, I think that the more complicated kinds of data, like if we've got an application and I've got, you know, a GitHub repository equivalent, then yeah, like we want more complicated semantics, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, that yeah, uh, should be an option. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm kind of disappointed that a lot of the like IPFS style things and you know features in Beaker Browser, for example, are um uh, are still file based essentially, and it's like missed opportunity there. Yeah. So, thanks for sharing me that though. Yeah, I'll be talking a little bit about IPFS. I think coming up too. Well, maybe maybe it's time to move on. We're I think mm -hmm. we're going to go a little bit over. Um, if anyone needs to go at the hour, please don't feel bad. Uh, disappearing um but oh. um yeah yeah just just very briefly um and for the recording uh brand message in chat saying the thing that i was looking for um it's called twizzler and um there's a link in chat to the usenix uh, presentation which is excellent and i recommend watching yeah sorry okay cool um great well so i'm probably gonna go maybe i'm guessing 15 minutes over and i'll also be around a little bit afterwards too but let's share screen. So, yeah. all right, um, this one and this one. Cool, okay, so I am, Ben was asking about how to build uh, decentralized networking with Braid because a lot of the examples we have so far are using central servers. And so I was like, okay, maybe this is gonna be a good time to illustrate a survey because uh, what our job is here, we're, we're trying to add these decentralized technologies to the existing web. A lot of the, exist a lot of the DWeb um, projects are building their own thing in parallel that's maybe decentralized from the ground up that isn't fully compatible, maybe doesn't support everything that people expect on the web. So um, I was having fun with acronyms. We're doing HTTP to P2P. This is how to go from HTTP to a, peer -to, to a fully peer-to-peer -peer web. And um, can I, okay. So our thesis or the belief is that we can extend HTTP into a fully peer-to-peer -peer web. We can make it something that's totally decentralized with four backwards compatible orthogonal extensions. 
So these are extensions, these ones backwards compatible and they're independent. You can add each of these extensions to the web independently. Each one provides utility on its own, which means that there's gonna be a reason for developers to adopt it and a reason for users to adopt the apps that developers are building with it. And that means that there's an incentive for it to get out there. And our work in order to make this happen, to bring the web into this world is to create the protocol specifications, the tools and the apps for each of these extensions. And this is mirroring the way that the web worked. The web succeeded because Tim Berners-Lee made both the protocol spec. He's like, this is how HTTP works. It's very simple. It's a nice protocol. It's easy for other people to implement. So other people started making web servers and, and web browsers. And here's how HTML works. Um, but he also made the world's first web browser and the first web server so people could play with it and get things going. And then he also created the world's first website. And that created enough that people can, okay, now I can make, if I want to put some information on the internet somehow, it was much easier to use this off the shelf server and tell people to use this off the shelf browser to read the document. All I had to do was type up the information in HTML. And that was way easier than trying to get all, all of my users to download WordPerfect and type in some telnet commands into my server to get the, the, the file. So he simplified all that, made some tools that made it easier for people to create content and easier for users to get that content and made all that stuff free. And we can do that same model to extend the web into peer-to-peer -peer and get adoption. And we're gonna do this with four different extensions. So these are what the extensions are. Uh, we've got, and in the past, we've talked about these as levels, levels of the protocol, but they're all kind of independent. Um, so we've got subscriptions. And so this is adding the features so that when you wanna get some state at a website, at a URL, you can not just get it right now, but continue to get all the updates to it. Um, then we have support for multi-router mutations. This is CRDTs and operational transforms. This is the versioning. This is all the patch formats. This is everything that Greg was talking about. Um, also, Angelo, you were talking about subscriptions when you're talking about long polling. So um, we're going to talk about both of those things separately. Um, then we've got message semantics. And so HTTP has, it's like, it's defined intrinsically in terms of client server. It's a client server protocol and it's request response. And so we have to come up with different semantics for those messages and those methods. And then the last part is the transport. So this is things like, um, this is what we will most think about as decentral, or what people tend to think about as decentralization. They're like, I wanna be able to just connect to a swarm to get my data. But these are all different. Each of these affords different aspects of decentralization. And so I wanna take you through these now. And by the way, um, these first two are already available in the current spec. And we are writing software using them right now. And we're also writing tools. So we've got a protocol, we're building tools and we're building apps. Um, next up, this peer-to-peer -peer message semantics. We've got some prototypes for it, but we haven't specified anything. And the transport layers is totally open for discussion. Bryn's implemented a bunch of stuff in Redwood. And so at some point, I think we'll get him in to talk about what he's been doing. Um, let's get started with subscriptions. So um, it's a very simple feature. You can add a, the stars of the new stuff. So this is from the spec. So here's a request. The new stuff is the stars. So we have this new subscribe header. And if you get the subscribe header, then the response, this is a normal HTTP response, except that it also confirms, yes, this is a subscription. And then instead of give, just giving one thing back, it says, here's the current version. And then over time, it's gonna give another version. And then it's gonna give another one. And the spec gives a way to break up the, the body into multiple bodies. And so that's a basic, Subscription, you just get multiple versions. Um, now, this, so this is a, very, is a very simple feature. What's awesome about this is that this is the first thing that makes a web developer leave REST. This is the first reason why when you're writing a website, you're gonna start building a, connecting with a WebSocket instead because you want real-time updates. And this is also why, so the web is designed for just static pages and uh, for just static pages that were written by hand. And so HTTP was just, we're just gonna 
transfer this HTML from the server to the client. And that's all that the web platform did. Then over time, developers started pulling, generating pages from a database. And so they just ad hoc invented all this model view controller stuff on the server. And then they had a model view controller stuff on the client. And all of this stuff is non-standard. And the reason why all this exists is to handle changing data. When something, the user is gonna make some change go in the database, and then it's gonna pop up through the models, the models are gonna to synchronize to the views. Um, and if we add support for change and subscriptions, then all of these can just be the same, uh, they can use the same API. The client can just grab a URL from the server. The server says, okay, I'm gonna to subscribe to this state. This state is subscribing to this state. This state subscribing to this state, which ultimately subscribes to the database. And if subscriptions are supported all the way through, and you can have, so you can have subscriptions to state within the client, within the server. Um, React gives you this ability of a component that updates, it re-renders whenever some state changes in the client. So then we can have a uniform model for state, and this makes programming a lot easier. And I've actually run some studies where we rewrote code in this way, and it cut out about 70% of the code. Because so much of what you're writing is just wiring things together. And this also gives you, um, I wonder if, here we go. Um, so here's the benefits of subscriptions. We're gonna standardize all the MVC cruft. Um, now developers, they don't have to like add in as many different tools. You can just use HTTP for everything and use the same synchronization tools. You have less to learn and it's also more powerful um, because like, for instance, if you set up a WebSocket, you're probably still gonna access your images over HTTP requests, but then your images aren't gonna update if somebody updates an image. If you have everything going over the same protocol, it can use a lot more of the same stuff. And we also get a new architecture where we're programming in terms of state instead of events. And this is this architectural change is something we've discussed before, but this is what really results in all this less code. Um, so there's a reason for developers to adopt it, but it also decentralizes the web because when you're programming all of your state back on the standard, then it means that any UI can attach to the data as easily as any other UI. And this decentralizes the control over the user interface. So here's a little you know, quick diagram. Today's websites, whoever controls the data controls how you interact with it. But by standardizing the access to data, we can build applications that can connect to multiple different data sources and multiple different UIs can be on top. And now the user can be in control of their, their interface. And so this separation of UI and data um, this is a, a really important type of decentralization that we don't always talk about, um, but this is maybe the most important thing facing users today of media, me, different media sites that are you know, forcing them to read certain things or just shoving things down their throat. Um, so that subscriptions, this dimension of subscriptions, it provides some built-in advantages for programmers and it provides a bunch of advantages to users if we have a standard way to do subscriptions. Okay, so the second type of extension is mutations. That's what we we're doing a lot of discussion today about. So um, mutations adds a few features to HTTP. We're adding a version header. We're adding the parents. We're adding a merge type, which says how multiple changes that happen in parallel merge together. And then we also add patch formats. And this provides advantages to developers because now it can they can guarantee multi-writer consistency. If you implement all of these features into your app, then you can have perfect collaborative editing and you can have a perfect offline mode. You can build local first software that just works offline. Um, this is very compelling, super useful to have this. But all these sub features can also, so the versions, parents, patches, and merge types, you can, these are also useful independently. Well, here's a couple examples. Um, if all you have, you can just add version, the version information to, your, to a resource like a script and then you can fetch a script at a, different, at a particular version. And that's nice just to have like historical publishing of your scripts. And maybe this app needs an old version of it. And you can, uh, I could edit this. You could have a version tag attribute in the script tag even. Um, if you just wanna subscribe to some logs or have some append only log, then you only need patches. You don't even, uh, you don't need the versioning information. And if you want to, let's say you have an append only chat, which we've been building these apps. Um, then if you wanna reconnect, 
add an old version and not get all the old stuff, but just get the updates, then you just need to add a version field. You need to know what version it was when you disconnected. And then when you reconnect, you have to say, I want everything from this version. And so you can add that feature to your app. Um, and you don't need to build the rest of it. You don't need a perfect synchronizer. Um, you can also have, uh, I think, Seth or Dwayne, you're talking about having, or maybe Angela, you're talking about Nginx being used as a front end to some back end server. And it could even, and it could kind of serve that data to multiple clients. And you can do the same thing with the CDN. And it's kind of, it's, they're both just proxies. And so if we have this mutation support, then a CDN can host dynamic state, which is not something we can do right now. CDNs only host static content and it becomes too hard with, a, with um, dynamic stuff. Um, and then this last thing that you can do with this mutation support, even without any of the other peer-to-peer -peer stuff, you can build into your app some WebRTC fallback that if your server goes down, the clients can just connect to each other and keep operating. And they don't care if the server goes down. And you could have, let's say you have a, a website that's like a forum or something. You could guarantee to your users that even if the server decides to ban them or um, that, that the user community could just be like, well, we can keep synchronizing with ourselves here. We have all, we have the protocol to share patches and stay consistent. Let's just fork off. We don't need the server. We can even spin up a new server that maybe has a different moderation standard for us and we can keep going there. Um, and this is also a nice guarantee for things like, um, like Twitter, when it started out, had, a, had an API and a whole bunch of people built custom clients for Twitter and it drove a lot of usage. And there's a lot of people who love these custom clients like tweet, tweet that mm -hmm. and stuff. And then they just cut off access to the API and nobody could use those clients anymore. And it really pissed people off and then, um, and, and now a lot of people are really afraid of trying to invest themselves writing code that's going to connect to some API. But if the, if the API supports mu the mutation standard, then you know that in the worst case, you can just spin up your own server and keep going somewhere. And you can't be totally, you're not going to be totally screwed. So uh, mutations, this feature is useful on its own. Each of these features are useful separately, but if you put them together, you get a bunch of great features. And it enables you to build into your app, your own, you can build your own WebRTC peer-to-peer -peer networking because all of the content and the information is there that you need to, like the, the information in these, in the messages, you have enough information that you can, you know, write your own custom transport layer just for your app that can make it peer-to-peer -peer and robust and decentralized. But we don't have this, it's not fully standardized yet. And that's what the next two extensions do. So what if we want to take HTTP itself and standardize it, like standardize a peer-to-peer -peer layer? So first thing that, that we might notice is that HTTP is inherently request response. It's inherently client server. And it has these methods like get, put, post, and delete that all have to be initiated by the client. You can't have a server do a get request to the client. <laughs> And say like, hey, you know, give me give me the video coming in from your camera, or give me the mouse cursor position. That all has to be initiated from the client. So this model that's baked into HTTP limits the behavior of mutations. Um, you know, you can't by default have the server can't make a change and push it to the client because puts, which do, mutations are done by puts, and puts have to come from the client. It limits validation, which has to be done by the server, and Acknowledgements. When you do a put, the server is going to respond with an ACK, and in that ACK, it's going to validate that data too. And so we can't, we don't have in the basic model of how HTTP does mutations, validation, and acknowledgements. There's no peer-to-peer -peer semantics to it. Um, and you see this when you're reading the spec. This is the spec for HTTP. It's, here's how. The, here's the request stuff. Here's the request stuff, and here's all these methods. Um, and in the definition of REST that Roy Fielding came up with. It's an inherently client server. So we need to generalize beyond that to have peer-to-peer -peer semantics for mutation, validation, and acknowledgement, because these are things we need to have in peer-to-peer -peer apps. So um, here's something that that might look like. Turns out to be a really nice, elegant extension generalization of the methods themselves. So in today's HTTP, if you do a get request or a so you have gets can have a request and response, puts have a request and a response. But there's an interesting similarity between a get response 
and a put request. Both of these, if you look at them as in a peer-to-peer -peer way, a get re response is the server telling the client, this is the current version. And a put request is the client telling the server, this is the current version. And so we can make these just one message. And so we can re-envision HTTP as a protocol that's just peer-to-peer -peer, and requests and responses are both just messages. Um, and we have different types of messages. And, it, and in the protocol, if you receive a get message, then you respond with a set. If you receive a set, then you respond with an ACK. And we can also have even two types of ACKs. Um, and I can, so, um, which we could go into, I don't know if we really, but these two types of ACKs. So ACKs can be used um, in a peer-to-peer -peer system. An acknowledgement, um, I'll show, go ahead and just show this thing, okay. So this is a prototype of a peer-to-peer -peer system. So um, I'm gonna, boop, I just sent a, a message out and you can see this is the set message and now it's coming back as an ACK. It's a slightly darker green, it comes back to the original node and then a second level of ACK goes out. And now it's done. I'm gonna erase this exclamation point and send another message out so you can watch it again. We have these bright green, that's the set message. Then it comes back as a first level of ACK and then it goes out again as a second level of ACK. And this is like a two-phase commit, which is um, a generalization of acknowledgements for a peer-to-peer -peer network. And this way you can know that, so that first level of acknowledgement, so here's the set, the first level of acknowledgement says, everybody that I've sent this to has seen it. I've got an ACK back from all them. And now, boom, now that the source knows that everybody who he sent it to has responded, he's like, okay, now everybody in the network has seen it. And so he sends out a global acknowledgement. And this is useful for knowing that, let's say that some of these peers are responsible for validating the change. Then you can use this to know that all of the peers who are responsible for validating it, all of them with any kind of authority have validated the change. Um, and another way that you can use this is for pruning information. So we're sending a bunch of, bunch of edits here. Now we have all these outstanding edits and we have to keep track of those because any of these guys might send an edit too based on one of them. But as soon as we get all the acknowledgements back, we know that everybody's caught up and all of their edits are gonna be made on just the newer ver newest version. And so we can prune out all the old ones. So these are some of the features that you get from generalizing acknowledgements from just a client server to a peer-to-peer -peer world. Um, so anyway, we have this prototype, but uh, we could extend HTTP, and generalize it in this way. And the key is that it's backwards compatible because any existing HTTP request and response has a mapping into this world. And that means we can continue to support existing HTTP while just adding new stuff. And that's what, as long as this provides value, people can adopt it without breaking compatibility. And then over time, the web can upgrade. Um, there's a couple of other messages that are useful, especially for the pruning to know when a peer has joined or a peer has left. Um, but these are some things that we can be working on. So just kind of giving an overview of the state of the art of the peer-to-peer -peer messaging. Also, HTTP2, um, I showed you, let me show you this thing too. This is the spec for HTTP version one. And it has request and response like on all this client service stuff embedded in the whole thing. HTTP2, the underlying protocol is actually peer-to-peer. -peer. And it has a semantics using that peer-to-peer -peer quality to embed request response client service semantics in it. And so they've actually laid a lot of the groundwork that we need already. Um, okay, here's a bunch of examples of things that we can, that you get if you add this, you know, if you use this extension, the server can request state from the client, the client can request state from a peer, you know, using the same standard protocol. One server could request state from another server. And so we can do that as we're building mashups. And the one server could also validate based on what that server says and maybe what the database says. And you can have multiple server, like transactions that can go across multiple servers and 
those can be the, the client can do a transaction across multiple servers and still validate them by looking at the acknowledgements from them. Um, I think if we, with a couple more things, we could also share validation rules and standardize them and distribute them around the network. And then when you connect to an app, you know how all the state needs to be validated and you know which peers are authoritative um, and you get this history printing. So here's a bunch of the benefits you get with that extension. Um, okay, the last one, I have done the least amount of investigation into this transport. And um, I know that Bryn has done some work into this, but this is the, these are the problems that I see us needing to solve. So we've, let's say we've already got the semantics in step three, um, but we are still limited to the fact that HTTP relies on URLs. Every URL uses DNS and DNS is centralized. And then it also, for all the encryption, it uses TLS and TLS is centralized. And the identities of agencies are only cryptographically verified via TLS certificates. And all you can verify in the standard is the, the identity of a server. You can't verify the identity of a peer. Um, there's there's a, num a bunch of work in these different areas. Um, uh, there's also route finding is necessary. Like if you're doing a get in a, in a mesh network, maybe you'd want a DHT to look up where that content exists. Um, so this is an outline of, of the issues. I'm sure we could discuss more of that. Um, but so I don't really know. Anyway, here's a general overview. Each of these four things can be done in parallel. I think this one is the most open right now. I haven't investigated it much. I'd be very curious to hear what other people are thinking about it, but we get a lot of benefits in decentralization at these other levels too. And so when building a decentralized app um, with Braid, I'd love to hear what in particular parts, like what particular decentralization values you're most interested in. And we can see if we can support that because if you're trying to build an app, then we could be like, okay, well, what kind of tools and protocol do we need to support that app? We'd love to see some motivating apps that want to use any of these levels and um, try to find a protocol that works for that. It's really helpful to have an app because then we know it gives us something concrete to support in the protocol and something concrete to build tools for. Um, and that's, that's the presentation. Um, I'd love to hear questions. In uh, the, sorry, in the P2P mutation uh, section, you uh, had a part about WebRTC. Is that's not currently in the Braid spec, right? Right. There's no spec for this, and that's why I was talking about this as app-specific fallbacks, because there's no standard for it. But it's we have some code to do WebRTC Braid messages, and it just encodes them as JSON objects instead of using the whole HTTP encoding. So we've, we've built that before um, and it'd be really fun to add into an app, but since we haven't specified it, there's no standard for it. So we couldn't guarantee that your app would be compatible with some other app using the, this WebRTC fallback. Okay. Does uh, anyone else uh, have anything or Maybe we can answer uh, Michael's questions about it. I've got this discussion topic too, if anyone's interested. Um, I just, my, you know, it's just a little controversy. A lot of DWeb projects have been focusing on decentralized transport, like IPFS. Um, but I claim the web's immediate pain points are in subscriptions and mutations. And IPFS, for instance, doesn't handle, doesn't have a good answer for mutations. Yeah, because most, uh, uh, like in terms of P2P transports, you've got like BitTorrent's like the biggest one and then you've got LibP2P, which is IPFS is one, which many, uh, what do you call it, Web3, like the Ethereum Web3 uh, network is using uh, LibP2P. And then there's other, you know, uh, library, which is like a decentralized YouTube. I looked at their, uh, thing that it's like a custom solution in Go. I think it may be using libp2p, but in terms of the browser world, 
uh, it seems everyone's delegating the P2P transport as WebRTC. There isn't a way to do that uh, via HTTP unless each peer is booting up a HTTP server, but then you still have some way of having to do the peer discovery, um, which you indicated in the talk that could be like a DHT, which is how uh, BitTorrent uh, Johnny does it all. Um, even Scuttlebutt uses a DHT, although that one's uh, a little bit different. Um, so in terms of uh, peer discovery in like a braid world, you could probably have it where HTTP servers track the peers because they're already tracking the peers via subscriptions to be able to know which versions the subscriptions are keeping up to date. Um, so yeah, that's correct. Um, so they could also send peers, uh, perhaps if the peer elects for that privacy to, you know, their, their peer ID to be open, um, they could then elect for the server to then say, hey, these are all the peers that uh, I have subscriptions with. Here's their IDs. You could also fetch data um, from them. And maybe the peer specifies which transports are able to receive, be that HTTP, be that WebRTC, be that uh, whatever other uh, transport uh, there is. Um, yeah, because Braid, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any question about Braid's ability to handle the merging and the subscription stuff. It's more uh, in the decentralized aspect of it. It's how can this stuff be built on top of Braid? And one of the things uh, there that uh, in uh, is my brain just reset. <laughs> so sorry. Um, what was it? Oh yeah, so would for if it's being done over web, sorry, over WebRTC, um, would we just be emulating the HTTP put uh, headers and all that just via a WebRTC data channel, or would it be its completely own transport uh, that would like? Are we just trying to emulate Braid, or is it its own transport? It seems from your slide today, it would be its own. Uh, transport that wouldn't be emulating necessarily the post put uh, get. Yeah, I, well, so I would imagine if you're if you want to make your own app specific WebRTC fallback, you would probably not use this string encoding. Okay, because this is a designed to be a general system that fits with the rest of the web. If you just want something that works with your app it's probably gonna be easier just to make JSON messages that just encode the, you know, the, the path, the version, the parents, the merge type, um, and then encode this as JSON however you want. You could I, use this yourself to too. This? Yeah, please do. Um, I've been learning a little bit about this too. And I think, I think what's hidden, there's sort of like a, a hidden Markov model here in, in Michael's head, I, I'm guessing, that there's actually like a braid, um, I, I will call it a braid schema, but it's not quite a schema. It's like a set of necessary components that you can um, translate into any potential protocol. So WebSockets and HTTP and um, WebRTC are among them. Um, the focus of braid so far has been on the HTTP specific version of that um, so that we can get something that's most universally applicable and, and um, beneficial. Uh, but but those four things that he mentioned, I think in one of those previous slides are kind of like the hidden, um, like this is one step back. Uh, if you have versions, parents, merge types, and uh, I can't remember what the fourth patches, thank you. Then um, you achieve all that you do, it, all that you want in Braid and you can do it over anything. Yeah, I, I do also anticipate us making a Braid WebRTC spec at some point. So that it's like, okay, here's a nice standard way to do this. Um, but there are some, I think like you, you run into, if you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer app, you're gonna have to solve privacy on your own too, if you're gonna give all this data to all of your peers. And that's, we don't have a general way to solve that. We haven't th thought that through, but for your app, it might be simple. You know, Maybe it's a public forum anyway, and you're like, okay, no problem. We'll just do it like this. And so, um, so that's, that's why I'm still thinking about this stuff is like, you can totally do some app specific design for WebRTC. At some point we'll wanna find the general model. 
Yeah, it, the biggest challenge there is going to be, I think, peer discovery. But we're about to see it has that peer discovery, right? With uh, what is it, the ICE servers or the signal? To... Signaling servers, yeah. So yeah. you can do peer discovery if you have a server and you just want the WebRTC part to be a peer to peer fallback then your server can be the initial signaling server. It can tell you who all the peers are to start off with. And then every peer that connects to the server can then connect and know their peers and now they're already discovered and that can exist and, and keep going. So you kind of get some of the benefits. It's kind of like a hybrid car. It's like half dirty gasoline, you know, but. <laughs> right. Yeah. And <clears throat> you had a slide there uh, for one of the issues with TLS. Uh, and DNS. So there's also, uh, at least for DNS, there's Handshake uh, and there's also the Ethereum name service. Hand when Ethereum name service, they seem like they just bought a normal TLD and yeah. then they're providing a blockchain for modifying it. When Handshake uh, is their own uh, kind of DNS system where that a resolver needs to actually uh, implement. Um, and if you're actually on GitHub uh, and you were had a significant following or something, you actually get like $500 worth of uh, handshake uh, tokens <laughs> to be able to buy decentralized stuff um, by an airdrop, which uh, is kind of nifty, but um, where was I going with this? Uh, so one of the uh, other things, there's also in this talk, uh, in today's meeting, it was mentioned HTTP2. There's also HTTP3 uh, that's, or, you know, around the corner, Safari is already implemented, Cloudflare is implemented. Uh, the other browsers have implemented, but it's under a feature flag. Um, and there's also a new transport uh, that seems to be going through the spec process uh, called web transport. Um, that seems to be wanting to extend from HTTP3. And they specifically mentioned P2P use cases uh, and things that could be useful to the uh, Braid world. They have a good explainer document here. Yeah. Um, could be worthwhile reaching out to them as well. I was in the, um, the Birds of a Feather session at the ITF talking about web transport. And I, I'd be curious to see that link because at the time they were talking about it mostly as a replacement for web sockets, um, which would you know scale up to HTTP2 and HTTP3 and also support unreliable delivery. So that's, um, uh, that's like less, yeah, I, I don't, at least then it wasn't intended as a peer-to-peer -peer replacement or a replacement for WebRTC. Okay. Uh, yeah, so they, well, they have that explained document that can be like looked into mm -hmm. on the side. Uh, I, I kind of sketched out a, for my own use case, I kind of sketched out a few weeks ago, um, like a way to kind of do it. I think by Cloudflare work is where it's kind of like a federated network where or may, I'm not really sure what the right decentralized terminology is because there always seems to be some overlap with things, but you essentially have one server. Uh, it's keeping track of the Braid subscriptions and then people can elect uh, whether or not they want their peer ID to be public. And then uh, other servers can synchronize uh, with that particular Braid server and then uh, give you back uh, kind of the listing of other Braid servers. Um, you know, from the peer, from the peers, if that makes sense. So each braid server kind of maintains its peer listing and also makes that shareable if the peer elected for it. Um, and then you could also do uh, certain encryptions. Oh, that was the other thing. So you also mentioned with TLS encryption, but people could generate their own public keys in the same way uh, uh, cryptocurrencies work, where you generate a public key and a private key. Uh, you could probably do the same for uh, braid and the whole peer discovery where like a peer is associated with a particular uh, key pair uh, and they can encrypt the messages and then only other people who uh, have that public key or that shared shared public key uh, can actually decrypt it. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I agree with you on all these things. I think you're listing a whole bunch of options that we can use to try to address these challenges and like try to solve the problems, find, find some standard way of, um, of having a peer-to-peer -peer transport. And probably the way to progress as a group is to list these out uh, in email maybe to start or maybe some um, documents somewhere that we could edit and we could keep adding new items on the list 
Um, we could add a little wiki page on the, the Braid website. And then I think we'd also wanna look at the trade-offs that, that are involved because ultimately we want to, we're trying to find some standard, something that's gonna work for everybody. And so we'd wanna figure out well, what are the costs of different approaches when we're building different applications, what kind of general features are we needing? What kind of issues are we running into? But I think the stage that we're at right now is to be brainstorming like you're doing and putting down some different options. Yeah, I, I also kind of separate in my mind the protocol. I mean, I guess maybe that's where we're coming from here. Like the protocol of what are the operational semantics, uh, which we need to have longer conversations around. And then the question of, yeah, transport. And then, um, yeah, and transport matters for several reasons, but, um, yeah, I think if we can be happy with the protocol semantics, then you know, it takes us most of the way there and then it's you know, converting. Um, and by the way, I did take a quick look at that web transport document and it does match my, you know, what, what we were talking about at ITF. So it's there's nothing there. There's nothing in web transport that's intended as a peer-to-peer -peer, um, system. Okay. Despite what people on Hacker News will tell you. <laughs> I'm still excited about it. It looks like it has... Oh. Unreli it has UDP. That's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about UDP as well. I am also excited about it because WebSockets drags you back into HTTP one, um, and there's no way to do WebSockets on HTTP two at the moment. So this is like solving that as well. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it'll be really good for. Um, I mean, you know, as they talk about right, like the video games and things like that, where you want like unreliable datagrams. Um, probably also for video streaming down the road, if you want to do server to client video streaming. So. So you're saying it's uh, uh, P2P is not really built in, but it could probably be built on top as that. Uh, no. P no, 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 okay. no. <laughs> it's very much server client. It's a server client protocol. So there's a server, a web server, there's a client, which is the web browser, and then the client right. connects the web browser. Uh, right. the, the web well, you have in the example, right? You do new web transport, you point it to a URL, right? If you have peer discovery as a separate thing, and then you know the peers, you could connect to them by web transport to those peers. Yeah, yeah, so long as the servers the, um, that you want to connect to have public IP addresses and web servers running, um, that could work. Yeah. Sorry, um, Angela, you were gonna say something? Sorry. Uh, I just have an, another topic, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, maybe I could ask Ben, um, I think you're trying to build an app right now and you're trying to build a, I think a decentralized YouTube kind of thing. Yeah. What features, and I think you're wanting, that's probably a driving uh, motivation for you to want some peer-to-peer -peer transport. Um, what do you want a peer-to-peer -peer transport for in this app? What, what, what are the benefits to this app of having that? Yeah, well, I, uh, I, there's multiple ways. I, I, by building a decentralized YouTube, it's not just one I, idea that I just want to use that as like a, uh, direction and then do many different implementations towards kind of achieving that goal. So it's more mm -hmm. like that's the goal. Let's do any and all implementations and help facilitate to getting towards that goal with as many people as possible. Um, so, you know, initially it could just be like uh, Cloudflare workers where you kind of help move people away from YouTube centralization or any of these tech company centralizations where people can boot up their own Cloudflare workers that solve certain problems or eventually um, actually, well, that's one side, but yeah, eventually the idea would be um, one of the apps kind of in that direction is called Fountain where you would have your own um, kind of library of videos or conversations and recordings in a kind of text like interface uh, and then you can share those recordings with other people um, and in a kind of like a scuttlebutt type manner. And uh, they would be multi, like people could also make certain claims to things like who's the participants in that conversation. Those claims can be verified. Um, people can comment and interact uh, with those videos, add responses to certain timestamps and whatnot, kind of just try and bring back like the brains of Google or the NSA to the actual public, um, starting with video, because it's, you know, to me, it's the most interesting, but it's also one of the most challenging aspects. It's kind of easy to do it with text because it's low bandwidth, you know, need high server costs, but video um, is very difficult for an indie web to compete with it. Uh, so just 
you know, that's kind of my avenue, which is how can, you know, what can be done to kind of further that goal of building a decentralized YouTube and a, but a collaborative YouTube, one that resembles YouTube uh, 10 years ago when people could actually add responses to the videos rather than just uh, uploading market and highly edited videos. So it sounds like you're actually interested in all aspects of decentralization. Yeah. 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 And yeah, pretty much, yeah, all of it. I, I watched uh, Social Dilemma uh, only a few days ago. Um, and yeah, I don't know, the whole situation is very uh, depressing. They didn't go into how bad it actually is. Uh, they could have gone a lot, <laughs> a lot more into the, how bad it actually is. Um, yeah, but uh, ultimately as well, I, I you know, if, if uh, you know, there's, just to put some of my thoughts in this is that um, one of the issues is, at least with YouTube or the attention economy, um, and Michael, you've spoken a lot about that, is that um, it is uh, in the social dilemma, they make the case that it's kind of like a drug. Uh, and it's hard to actually kind of get yourself uh, off that drug or that issue because you know, there's highly engineered things trying to claim your attention. And then you're also thinking, um, why aren't they actually paying me for my attention? Uh, why isn't, and in the movie, they also presented, why don't we tax attention or tax data? Uh, and that seems interesting, but at the same time, uh, I think, uh, at least for myself, one of the things I'm looking to explore is just like uh, a world without, uh, I, like I haven't used Facebook since like 2014 or whatever, but kind of a world without YouTube uh, would be interesting because I don't think, um, I, at least for myself, it's having a positive effect on my life. <laughs> so, yeah. So it, that's where like the offline first or the local first uh, way of doing it. Like what would a local first YouTube actually be like? Um, and then you also have alternative sites like Lively, Good Site, Best Score, uh, things like that, where they kind of, but they've all had legal issues before in live week, they ended up getting bought out and now there's less content on there. And then you have the other ones like BitChute and all the modern uh, versions of it that have all got like the worst of the internet to move to because that's the people who need those platforms. Um, when they still seem to all suffer from like the same issues, which is, let's build something that just capitalizes on people's attention. When, if we start with something that is local first, then it's just like, hey, why don't I just have like a, you know, video journal? Um, and then I can share those videos with other people. Like what is a more humane centric approach to video um, or our conversations uh, rather than one where it's like, hey, let's put every single conversation onto something that where, you know, you have all the, attention issues of, of the modern uh, attention economy. At least that's the whole spiel of my thinking going into, into break. Cool. That sounds very compatible. It sounds like we're gonna be, we're developing the same direction, I think. Ben, ben we, should, uh, we should talk about this at some point because I was working early last year, um, just on some kind of proof of concept demos using uh, Braden Redwood for like a Twitch clone and mm. uh, sort of like a Zoom clone, um, which seems pretty related to what you're working on. I actually discovered Braid through Redwood. Um, so I, was, I always keep searching for like decentralized stuff on GitHub every like month or so to keep track of what's what's happening and then found Redwood and found Braid from it. So yeah, I, I'm happy to talk with as many people as necessary to kind of accomplish that goal. <laughs> so. Did you, uh, you click the affiliate link, right? Uh, the affiliate <laughs> link? I'm just messing. <laughs> uh, I, I understand the joke. <laughs> I thought you were being serious, but yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't understand the joke. It's the. Why? Well, I, I it, it's for like a lot of services. You get affiliate links will give you money. So then it's like, oh, maybe oh. maybe Brian should get some money for uh, oh. some kickback for the uh, referral to break. <laughs> I see, like an Amazon affiliate link. 
Um, I'm fading, so I'm going to have to bounce out. Uh, so if you guys want to hang around, but I think I'm going to bounce. So. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop the recording. I'll hang around for a little bit too, but um, bye, Seth. Right. Thank you guys. Go see you, Seth. Thanks. Thanks for everybody presenting.